This is a replay from the Vacation Rental Success Summit 2018 held in San Antonio, Texas. This event was sponsored by and with thanks to Platinum Sponsor Vacation Rental Formula, Gold Sponsor the Association of Vacation Rental Operators and Affiliates, Silver Sponsor a Bold PR, Bronze Sponsors Booking.com, Proper Insurance, Point Central, and Hello Here. Join us for the next Vacation Rental Success Summit and buy your tickets now. Visit VacationRentalSuccessSummit.com for more details. The year was 1948. Charles Lazarus had an innovative yet very simple idea. He was going to offer furniture for children at a store. That's it, no adult furniture. It was the first time it had ever been done. And so he said, I'm gonna have this furniture store. I'm gonna bootstrap it. I'm gonna grow this business from the ground up. It was Washington, D.C. He was the salesman. He was the inventory guy, the bookkeeper, the delivery man, he did it all. It wasn't too long before he started realizing there might be opportunity for additional monetization. And so at, at Children's Bargain Town, what he decided to do was he was going to offer toys to these parents as they came in to purchase the different furniture pieces. And so it started out with a, a cradle gym, and the next thing it was a doll or a tricycle. But as he offered toys, he found the parents would come in multiple times a year. So they'd come in at birthdays and Christmas and when new toys were released. And it wasn't too long before Charles realized there was more money to be made in toys than there was in furniture. So he pivoted his business into Toys R Us. And Toys R Us began to grow very rapidly. In 1957, he had a revolutionary idea, an idea that totally changed the retail market, not just in toys, in every aspect of retail. It was called the supermarket concept. He was going to have long rows of stacked goods, just like a supermarket does. Now that doesn't sound so revolutionary today because today we have Walmart and Target and all these other supermarket concepts that are out there. This was five years before the first Walmart. This was just, retail was changed forever from this idea. His growth continued. By 1980, he was a leader in technology. He was using computers like this. Stock analysts said that Toys R Us was the number two brand in the world technology-wise, for proprietary technology, behind only IBM. One of the hottest stocks on the entire New York Stock Exchange. Things were exploding. It wasn't long, and they had 1,800 stores. They had 64,000 employees. Things were going well. In fact, they sold 75% of all toys in the United States, 25% of all toys in the world. It doesn't get any better than that. In fact, it was so good that in 1999, their website after Thanksgiving Day was one of the top five visited in the entire world. They were processing so many orders, they couldn't even fulfill them all. They were fined by the FTC because they took all these orders and couldn't ship them out in time. They were considered one of the top tech brands. They owned toys.com, they were doing great. In fact, they were doing so great that they were overwhelmed. Folks, that's a good problem, too many customers. But they didn't think so. So they went to a very young company at the time, Amazon, and they said, hey, guys, let's partner together. Let's do a deal. This distribution is too difficult for us. We can't handle that. And so even though we have the product figured out, the customer acquisition figured out, conversion figured out, all the hard pieces of the puzzle were figured out, what we're going to do is we're going to mortgage our future and we're going to do a deal with Amazon. And so Amazon and Toys R Us, they sat down together. And Toys R Us said, we will pay you $50 million a year, and we will pay you a percentage of every sale if you will sell our products on Amazon. And Amazon thought about it for a minute, and they said, yeah, we'll do that, but what we want you to do is take down your website, forward ToysRUs.com and Toys.com to us, give us all of your customers, and we'll, we'll do the deal. Toys R Us, and they, they went back and forth a few times, and, and they ended up on an ex exclusive 10-year partnership. So Amazon would not sell any other toys other than Toys R Us's toys, and Toys R Us would not have a website again for 10 years. It's a very bad deal. 
Things kept trucking along, though. 2001, Toys R Us opens 110,000 square feet. That can be measured in acres. That's almost three acres store right in Times Square, in the middle of the most popular city in the entire world. So they open this store. It has 750 employees. When people go to it, they say it is more like an amusement park than a toy store. There's a 60-foot high Ferris wheel right in the middle of the store with a Cabbage Patch Kid car, a little Tykes car, all of these just awesome things that kids love. There's a 5,000-square-foot Barbie house. Little girls don't have to imagine what Barbie lives like. They can go in and experience it. There's 20-foot-high Lego towers that mimic towards, uh, 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 the Manhattan skyline made out of these Legos, tens of thousands of Legos to make each one. A Willy Wonka-themed candy store right there in Toys R Us. This was in 2001. When you went to a conference in 2001, people did not talk about experience. They were ahead of the curve. They got it. This was the experience-driven economy. Before that was a book, before that was a word. They understood things. You remember that deal with Amazon? It started to go south. Amazon got a little greedy and they said, yeah, we told Toys R Us, we do this exclusive deal, only sell their toys. It took about a year for internal memos to start going around and saying, hey, we're leaving a lot of money on the table here. And so before too long, about a year and a half into the agreement, Amazon breaks the agreement and starts selling the competition toys as well. Toys R Us says, hang on a minute, you can't do that. That's not what our agreement says. We want to open back up our web brand. But their legal agreement was a little bit iffy, so they couldn't. And so they got in this long court battle as they're continuing to pay Amazon $50 million a year and continuing to send every one of their customers to Amazon. They can't sell their own toys on their own website. They have to give all the customers to them. Finally, in 06, six years after the agreement was formed, they're able to open back up their own web brand. As, as late as this year, in investor reports, they said this was a crippling blow and that they were still 10 years behind because six years in e-commerce, six years in the web is an eternity. They gave all their customers away. This isn't easy to recover from. That toy store we were just talking about, it closed in 2015, gone. The website closed down March of this year, announced liquidation. All U.S. stores announced that they were closing in March of this year. This is a, an iconic American brand. They're a brand that did a lot of things right. They got it, except they made some mistakes. They didn't evolve at critical times. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I want each of you to evolve in these critical areas. We're going to go through four areas this morning. The first one's customer acquisition, because without customers, None of us, whether we're an owner of one property, a vendor here, or whether we are a big property manager, without customers, we don't have a business. The customer acquisition in the vacation rental industry has followed a, a fun path. It started out with Craigslist ads and, 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 and classified ads in newspapers and backs of magazines. And the way the, the customer purchase journey went, they'd pick up the phone, they'd call an owner or a property manager, and they'd say, hey, tell me about your property. And then they would trust the person that describes the property on the other end. Yeah, it's really nice. It has a good view, and they hope it actually has one. And then they would show up after mailing a check through the mail or a money order through the mail, and they might find exactly what had been described or it might be completely different. This was how customer acquisition started in our industry. By 2003, when I was booking my first vacation rental for my honeymoon to Hawaii, it was this site, VRBO. They had over 13,000 properties. It was big time. They had photos, even a few reviews on some of the properties. And so I found the perfect little place in Hana, Maui, and it was available for my dates, and the price was reasonable. So then this clunky booking process starts, where it turns out those dates aren't actually available. They were doing some tricks with the calendar that I would figure out later on when I was in the industry. They, uh, the price wasn't accurate. And so we went back and forth for about a week. We finally narrowed down a price and some dates that were available. We booked it. And uh, she's like, we're, we're going to go ahead and block the calendar now. Go ahead and mail us a check. And, and we know that's going to take a week or so. So we mailed the check. It gets to them. We go. We have a great honeymoon. It was awesome. It's different today. This is what a guest expects today. They want to see dozens of reviews. They want assurances that everything is going to go OK if they complete a transaction. 
They want to be able to check the dates, receive instantly accurate prices, and then be able to book it in about 30 seconds using a credit card. Customer demands change with time. Customer acquisition changes with time. It's changed for all of us in this room. Nearly all of us are advertising on one or more of these booking sites. It's not classified ads anymore. These booking sites, though, they also have customer acquisition challenges. I know, I own one of them, a small one. So back in 2009 and 2010, VRBO said, our goal is to rank number one for vacation rentals. We're going to do SEO, and we're going to do it right. We're going to dominate the big term vacation rentals. And they did. They did everything it took. They acquired companies. They built out an SEO team. They, they did everything they needed to do to rank number one. In fact, they have three out of the top four rankings there for the organic results. They have two out of the top three for the paid. And life is good. But there's one problem. Wait, that can't be right. Vacation rentals are trending down? The search term is, why? People don't stay in vacation rentals anymore. They stay in these. Not the treehouse, the idea. We're staying in Airbnbs now. And as that transitioned, it turned out that VRBO had won the battle and lost the war. They owned the ranking for a term that doesn't matter anymore. Airbnb killed that term. That's the search for Airbnb versus the head term, vacation rentals. VRBO can't outrank Airbnb for the term Airbnb. They've lost. The race is over. Airbnb won the race. It's now a race for second place, and VRBO may not even come in second. This is bad, but it's easy to point fingers. It's easy to say VRBO was an idiot. They did this wrong. Because when we started our brand, I said, huh, I know how to do this stuff. I'm going to rank number one for Smoky Mountain cabin rentals. Same thing VRBO did. Problem is, we have Google PPC, we have the Google Local, and that way down there. I call that the one-ish position. Don't let a digital marketing consultant lie to you. I used to do this stuff, I used to consult with big brands, and they're going to tell you, just do things right, follow Google Terms of Service, and follow those good uh, principles, and you don't have to worry about algorithmic updates, you'll never get penalized. It's bull. Google says, I'm doing it right. They put me in number one. You can't get higher than number one, unless you're in Google Local or Google PPC. But Google's saying he's doing it right, and that still hurt me. Updates can hurt you, even if you're doing everything right. There have been several dozen uh, different variations of this one page in the last year. So we thought to ourselves, what can we do similar to Airbnb? How can we change the conversation? How can we create a search term that's not search today? And we thought about fireflies because in the Smoky Mountains where we're from, there's this idea of synchronous fireflies. It's one of several places in the entire world where this happens, but seven to 10 days each summer, all the fireflies congregate down in this one valley and they begin to blink at dusk. And a few minutes later, they're all blinking in unison, thousands and thousands of them. And it's a sight like no other. I've been able to take my family to it a few times. But what I'd realized was we did what we all do about our own destinations. We minimized those exceptional experiences. And I realized if we just created a, a little bit of a guide to how to come here and experience this, that it would likely resonate with potential travelers. The thing was, there was no search volume for this. And I'm an analytical person, so I, I have a process. If we're going to put money into promoting a piece of content and creating a piece of content, I want to make sure it's going to make me money. But this worked with the Airbnb idea because there was no search volume for Airbnb either. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to create this, this new search term. And we did. It brought us tens of thousands of site visitors. Here's a graph of from when we launched it to, to now, as many as 2,000 visitors in a single day coming to read about synchronous fireflies, even though Google said there were only 1,000 searches a month. We created the search demand. So why does that matter? Because that one piece of content that we created in one afternoon that we did a little bit of promotion on made $30,000 for our brand in one quarter. So when you can create that demand and you find that experience and you don't just go after that same head term that everybody else is going after, there's a lot of opportunity there. So customer acquisition is the first way that we must all evolve in. 
and conversion, meaning how many people that come to our brand can we actually convert into a customer, is the second way. So your first tool in your toolbox to convert people is risk reversal. So what risk reversal is, the idea that a customer, as they're thinking about purchasing from your brand, has real and perceived risk that is associated with that transaction. If you can take that risk away from them, it's been proven in many studies that you're going to be exponentially more likely to convert that customer. So J.R. Watkins was a door-to-door -door medical uh, sales guy in 1885. And he had this idea that he would offer a money-back guarantee. That doesn't sound like a big deal to any of us, but he's the one that invented the money-back guarantee. It didn't exist at this point. So he, he would go up to the door and he'd say, I've got this, uh, this medical solution that's going to heal your ailment. And they would be very, very skeptical. And he would say, there's a trial mark on the back of the bottle here. As long as you don't use below that, the next time when I come back through town to sell you more, I'll give you back all your money if you aren't satisfied. This blew up his business. He ended up with, with hundreds of products, 86,000 salespeople at the peak of his company, and the company's still around today. In fact, where Matt had the Inner Circle uh, meetup yesterday, there were bottles of J.R. Watkins soap in that house today, all because he figured out how to risk, uh, take that risk on himself. Zappos, great example here, a current example. Tony Shea, he has this idea that he's going to deliver happiness to each customer. And if he can deliver happiness, he knows that they'll be more likely to, to be a big customer for life. And one of the ways he does that is he takes all the risk on himself. When he started this, it was two-way shipping. You could return stuff for free. He was the first one to do that. If you call in and say, hey, I want a pair of 11 shoes, but I'm not sure they're going to fit. The person on the other end will probably tell you, why don't you get a 10 and a half, 11 and 11 and a half, we'll send them all to you, and then you just send back those other two, we'll pay for the shipping on all of them. They want to take all of that risk out of the transaction, and it's helped him grow that from a small brand to a billion dollar plus exit when he sold it to Amazon. In our own industry, CJ, are, are you here? There's CJ right down here. Good friend of mine, he lives right down the road. Uh, two hours away or so from Gatlinburg, he has Southern Comfort cabin rentals. He and I were talking last year, and he, and he was telling me, I'm going to figure out a way to reverse risk on all of my customers this year. I'm going to grow my business and give people a better experience at the same time. The first thing he did was pretty simple. He said, any guest, any guest that books with us has 48 hours to cancel, penalty free. And that was a new policy that he came up with. And he told me that that's helped grow his brand. Because now that he has that, it turns out when he's on the phone with somebody and, and his reservationist is talking and they say, hey, let me check the, with my husband or wife and I'll give you a call back tomorrow. Now the reservationist can say, I'd hate to see you lose this property. Uh, why don't we do this? Take a small deposit from you and you have 48 hours. After you talk with your wife, your husband, no problem. You just give us a call back and we'll refund your money if you don't want the property. But if you get off the phone, you could lose the property. It allows them to convert more. His staff is now more productive. And in addition, each of his lead channels converts at a higher volume. The second thing that uh, CJ did, he said, guess they can move the reservation. If they need to cancel up to a certain time, he's going to let them move penalty free. And they can, they can change to a different property, they can change to different dates, and they can do that in an unlimited amount of times. So now instead of getting a small cancellation fee, he's keeping customers for life. He's not losing the customers. And so those two things have helped him grow his business this year. When we were in property management, we did this. We reversed risk. In paragraph 21 of our contracts, we told all of our owners, if they were dissatisfied for any reason, they could just pick up the phone and call us, and we would refund all of their commissions. Because they didn't believe what we were telling them during the sales process was true, and so we backed it up, and we took all of the risk on ourselves. But guess what? This was that perceived risk that I was telling you about. Because we knew we could deliver on the promises, and we never had one owner take us up on the guarantee. And we never had one owner leave us for a competitor the entire time we were in business. So the risk reversal piece works. Listening is another conversion optimization tool in your toolbox. When you listen to customers, they will give you the answers. They are your free consultants. If 30 years ago, I told any business owner, I have this tool that allows you in the mind of your customer 
and you can read their thoughts at the exact moment that they are thinking about purchasing or using your product, you would have been like, I'll pay for it. I don't care what it is. Now we have that. It's called Facebook. We, we know what they're thinking as they're using the product. We know what they're thinking as they're, as they're completing the purchase. We have social media. We have reviews. We have all these different things. One of the things we do at SmokyMountains.com, from time to time, we put live chat up on the website. And it's not so much about answering the questions for that one person as figuring out what the bigger conversion barriers are for the site. We're a small team, just two of us. It's Wes or me that's answering and that's live chatting with that person on the other end. But when we do that, they give us the keys to our future, future success. This, uh, this one right here, that's me going back and forth with somebody. They were having a problem checking out after we relaunched our site. And from this one chat interaction, we realized that there was an Internet Explorer error on one critical page of our site. Even though we tested a bunch of pages and paid a, a consultant to test all these different browsers and everything, there was an error on the checkout page. That's an important page. This, this one consumer told us about it. We fixed it. That's a 10% conversion recaptured. We would have lost 10% of our customers had we not listened to that one customer. So we're going to listen and we're going to reverse risk, and we're going to improve conversions. And the next thing we have to evolve on if we're going to survive long term is revenue. Yield management and optimization. I hear you saying, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really like yield management. I'm not convinced it, it works. Does it even work? American Airlines says, yeah, it works. The year they implemented it, they doubled their profits. Doubled them. Marriott Hotels, $100 million of, of found profit the year they implemented it. And I hear you guys. You're saying, but, but we're just one person. It works for you, too. We'll talk more about that in a second. But this works for me. I have one property. It worked for me when I was in property management, regardless of size. Yield management is a huge tool. If you ask this guy, he's going to say it absolutely works. He's paying more for that last-minute seat in coach than one of the guys up in first class. Yield management works. So it's going to work best when there's high demand. You're going to be able to increase the rates up to whatever the supply and demand curve will accept. But it also works well during low demand periods because it's going to allow you to convert more and make more in a slow period. One of the companies that has this best uh, is Uber. Uber gets this. From the beginning, they said the 100-year-old the taxi model was outdated. It didn't look at supply and demand. It was a constant price regardless of what was going on. And Uber will increase the price as much as tenfold during New Year's Eve at Times Square. Uber changes pricing between every uh, three and five minutes as many as 20 times an hour. It's part of the secret of their multi-billion dollar valuation, this surge pricing, they call it. In our own industry, Eric Brion from Vacasa last, last year at Skift, he said, the vacation rental industry is this, it's flat lines when it comes to pricing, maybe a bump here or a bump there for a holiday or a weekend. It's an immature approach. And then he goes on to say, I make a lot of money off of not being immature. My friends over at Wheelhouse made this graphic for me. It's the trailing year through, through April 1st of Seattle. The red line, the flat line that Eric was just talking about, the green line, the hotels, they have revenue managers on staff, they have best-in-class software, and they get it. There's a lot of money to be found in yield management, so they do it. There's tools that work for you if you have one property, lots of them. This is just one of them, Wheelhouse. You can put in those last-minute discounts, you can put in the weekend adjustments, the variable minimum stays, the holiday adjustments, all of this stuff, you can put it in, and then it can push it automatically into your listing or into your software. And if you don't trust it, you can set a ceiling and a floor, and it will keep it between those two. Or you can just put in yield optimization rules without the dynamic pricing. You can choose how much uh, a leeway you give the tool. This was my property. By implementing a tool like this, it went from 60 to 65% occupancy. That's just a 5% bump. We went up 10% in our average rate. And from that together, it was 20% of found revenue. It works. These tools, you can go very, very high level with a strategic view of your market, all the way down to low level, granular, pushing it in on a daily rate basis. You have all these tools to pick from, and there's more that aren't even on this slide. So conversion, or I'm sorry, so yield management is something we all need to look at. Additional fees, 
That's another area that we really need to be thinking about evolving in. So additional fees, these guys have it down. 300 bucks on a week in Hawaii that they charged us. And before we get too upset at Homeway, the same week, 300 bucks that they charged us. It doesn't matter, Airbnb, Homeaway, they all have it. It's a traveler fee, right? And I hear you guys, we're talking at the bar and you're saying, it's killing my bookings. This fee that they're putting in there, it's hurting me. But there's a problem with that. It doesn't jive with the bigger numbers. The bigger numbers say 46% increase in bookings per unit year over year. 46% up. Higher site conversion. If they have 100 visitors come, more than the percentage last year converts this year. They have new listings growing too. So if, if your bookings are shrinking from these sources right now, first off, ask yourself, have you had a 46% increase on your website this year or in your other channels this year? Are you doing that? Because if you aren't posting the same 46% increase this year, then you're behind these guys. And 46%, and that tells you that a lot of people are winners. There's winners and losers in any update, and this means that you're one of the losers if you're getting less bookings. If you talk to the best-in-class property managers, the best-in-class cl owners, they're going to tell you they're getting more bookings this year. This could be a problem with you, so look inside. So this is our response, right? Book, direct, and save. So we're going we're gonna to get, get that traffic back from the listing sites. This was a big movement this year. We're going to book, direct, and save. And property managers put this out there. Homeowners put this out there. Book, direct, and save. This was a quote from a property manager that I respect very much. And he said, hey, hey, book with us. If you book over here with us, we'll save you 100 bucks." Book, direct, and save. That's the narrative. So we're making it all about price. I thought we talked about this last year. We can't make it a race to the bottom. We can't make it a race to the bottom. We lose that race. Because guess what? When they book direct, they don't save. That's a lie. We're trying to do this altruistic thing and save people money. That's what we're telling ourselves. But if you really want them to book direct, it's not going to save them money. Because there's 30 properties maybe on your site or one property on your site where they're going to save the most money is if they go to a site with 1,000 properties and no booking fee. And there's one of those, so why don't we just do it, booking.com and save. They have no traveler fee. They have 1,000 properties. They can get exactly what they want. They can get it for a cheaper price, and there is no traveler fee. So when we make this about a price conversation, we have to ask ourselves, booking.com and save might should be the narrative. Is this the hashtag for next year? You guys decided. We talked about it last year. Don't make it into a price conversation. We leave that conference, and then we make it into a price conversation. What if we did something exceptional instead? What if we put our heads together and said, hey, we'll charge the same fee. If they're charging a 10% fee, we'll charge a 10% booking fee, but then we're going to do something exceptional that HomeAway cannot do. And so when a guest checks into our unit, we charged them that 10% fee. We had price parity, but now we use that for a cheese platter, a wine bottle. They're in the unit with a handwritten thank you note when they check in. We give them that exceptional experience, that warm welcome when they get there. And by the way, in that note, it says, go on down to the beach. We negotiated a deal. Show them that card, and you can use the stand-up paddle boards, boards, the kayaks. You can have beach service there, and it's all on us because we charged the same fee, but now we provided an exceptional service. What if instead of making it a race to the bottom, if you're in the Smoky Mountains, you hire a guide that takes people up the, the mountain two days a week, and it's free of charge if, if you're a property manager there? What if you charge the same fee and do exceptional things with it? So the fourth way that we need to evolve, the fourth way that we need to, to, to make sure that we're staying ahead of the curve is product itself. So unfortunately, Many people in this room and many people in this industry are in the mattress business. We, we have these beds. We put heads in them. Heads in beds. You know, we hear that saying. And so we're in this mattress business. I didn't sign up for this. I don't want to be in the mattress business. I don't even like mattress stores. I signed up for this. I want to be in the dream business. I want that turquoise water and the beachfront rentals or the mountains. I want to see people happy. That's what I signed up for. Not mattresses. Funny thing is, this, this uh, property manager here, they're on a, a, a small island. They actually began to see a decrease in business a few years back. The reason they saw that decrease in business was this. Little 
tiny runway. I've landed there multiple times. It's not fun. It's the top 25 most dangerous runway in the world. It's about 30 feet wide and 3,000 feet long. And if you get on the brakes and the reverse is just right, you don't go off the end. <laughs> Two ways to get, actually three, to get to this island. You can take your yacht in. You guys have a yacht? You can take your private plane in. Yep, didn't think so. Or you can go in on a single engine prop plane that's pretty sketchy. Yeah, so they were having problems. People weren't willing to do that for these turquoise waters because the internet made it a small place and they realized, hey, we can get the turquoise waters somewhere else. And so it wasn't enough to drive people back to the island again. People were going to places that were easier to get to. Until this happened, swimming pigs. <laughs> swimming pigs? What does that have to do with a vacation rental? Everything, because vacation rentals are about dreams. There's a small island close to Staniel K there that has swimming pigs, and it was popularized by accident on a television show. And now people have to go there, and they're willing to, to risk their lives or whatever it takes to get into that little runway. I understand this. I've been there five times. I know the risks intimately with that runway, and I want to go back. I want to hear my six-year-old daughter laughing and giggling and playing with the pig in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, so I understand that. It's not about the mattress. In our state, in the state of Tennessee, there was a fantastic marketing coordination last year during fall. I wish we had thought of it. We didn't. The state of Tennessee did it. And they realized that one out of every 12 men were colorblind. And, and there are a lot of colorblind women as well. And these were the people that were paying for the vacations coming into market. And these people couldn't see color during fall. So they came up with this idea of colorblind viewers that would allow colorblind people to experience color. This, this is really cool stuff. This is the kind of thing I want to do. Check this out. This is a guy named Jim. He's, that's what he sees normally, these greens and these grays. As he looks, for the first time in his life, he experiences color and fall, and it comes to life. I mean, look at that. Just color. During the interview right after that, he breaks down in tears, and he says he imagines this is the difference between earth and heaven. He, he wanted to experience this before. He doesn't care about the bed. So I got a, a ticket. Two miles an hour over. I hear some of you, you deserve it. You're We're in the tolerance of the radar gun. Come on, guys, that's not cool. So I get the ticket. I'm sitting up there, he's writing the ticket, running my tags. He brings me up the ticket and hands it to me. And I think to myself, this young cop that handed me that ticket, was this what he signed up for? When he went to the police academy, did he envision writing tickets for one and two miles an hour over? Or did he want to change the world? He wanted to change the world. Something had happened. And he was now writing tickets for two miles an hour over. I think some of us do that same thing. We're down at the bar. We're talking about the time we got down from $100 to $50. Is that what you signed up for? Are you talking about $100 to $50? I signed up to make people's dreams come true. We got this email last year. This lady here on the left, she wrote me. She said, this picture right here, it's her most prized possession in the entire world. This was 40 years ago. That's her husband and her daughter, and they're riding the Gatlinburg Skylift. She says she looks at this picture every day, multiple times, with fond memories of when her husband was still alive. He passed away recently. And when her daughter was young, she's fully grown now and in the armed forces out abroad. She said, this is her prized possession. I want to help people make memories like that. That's what I signed up for. Not negotiating a discount from $150 to $50. We have to rethink what our product is. Is our product just a mattress? Or is it something bigger? Is it a dream that we are selling somebody? So these are the ways that we must evolve 
If we're going to stay relevant, we must evolve in customer acquisition, conversion rates, revenue, and even product. And when we evolve in these ways, we will make sure that we're still here later on. I want to close with a story about Blockbuster. In 2000, Blockbuster had 10,000 stores. If you wanted to rent a movie, you were probably going here to rent it. And in 2000, the CEO of Blockbuster had a meeting with Reed Hastings, who had started up this little company named Netflix. So Reed Hastings had had a $40 fine, and he didn't even want to tell his wife about it because she got so mad at him every time he forgot to return the movies. And he said there has to be a better model. And he was thinking about that as he drove to the gym one day. And he realized that at the gym, you could work out all you wanted for a set price. So he comes up with, with Netflix, where you can get all the movies you want through the mail. So they're meeting there. And the Blockbuster CEO is talking with Reed. And he says, hey, um, you know, I, I like this OK, but I don't think this is where the future is. I don't think that people are ever going to get movies through the mail. He was wrong. 25 million subscribers later, fast forward, it's 2011. Netflix is now a publicly traded uh, company. It's a rocket ship. It started at $8, and now it's all the way up to $40. And people love it. They're fanatics about his brand. But you know, evolution requires things that make people angry sometimes. It requires painful decisions, and that's where they found themselves. Because in 2011, he made the tough call. These little circular things that we stuck in these players and watched TV on, he did not think that was the future. He thought this new idea, streaming television, original content, was going to be the future. And so he said, we're going to break these two memberships out because that will give us the budget that we need to do great things in the future. And his, he lost a million subscribers immediately. The stock tumbled down to just the lowest price it had ever been. The analysts, like Jim Cramer, were saying, short the stock. It's going out of business. This was painful. But he changed the way the world watches TV. We don't use little discs anymore. That's how my kids watch TV. They're on tablets. They're on phones. They're watching whatever they want, whenever they want it. The world watches TV in completely new ways. And the stock market responded. It went from $8. That was just a blip on the radar all the way up to $300 plus today. But it was painful, but it worked. 120 million subscribers today. That's more than there are households in the US. This was fantastic. Now each of us knows that Blockbuster went bankrupt, that the Blockbuster store is not where we go rent movies anymore. They had the opportunity to buy Netflix. That was their evolution point that they missed. They lost. They missed. They're gone. Netflix got the last laugh. Now we all watch TV like this. This is how we're watching TV now. That's my bill from when I canceled cable. They had to refund my last month to me, $250. That's crazy, $250. And people have been saying forever, we only want to pay for the channels that we're watching. But they aren't listening. Viewership is going down in a very strong economy. With more discretionary income than perhaps ever before, viewership is dropping. They're down 10% in the last five years. And it's because of things like this. YouTube TV. Here, you get all the same channels. Unlimited DVRing. You get six accounts, and it's all for 40 bucks a month now. <sighs> Problem is, cable companies, the satellite companies, they're coming along and they're saying, hey, uh, us too, we have something similar to that now. You can pick your channels. There's a problem here. If you ignore your customers for three decades, <laughs> an innovative person comes in and solves that problem they've been complaining about, me too doesn't work anymore. People are ticked. This quote right here is a perfect one. It's by Jim Collins and Built to Last. He says, if you have a, a, a great idea, and it could be an expanding market like vacation rentals as well, or, or like cable at that point, it creates a false sense that you are stronger and more successful than you actually are. You feel great. You feel like you're, you're invincible. But he says, failure to evolve can then lead to extinction. Let that set in. 
So you guys are thinking, hey, all right, we'll evolve. We're going to now distribute to two of these. <laughs> That's not evolution. We've got to evolve in these areas we were just talking about. If your idea is distributing to one more of these guys, and that's all you're going to do to evolve, you might as well just be Toys R Us forwarding your website to Amazon. I don't think anybody wants to do that in this room. So there's this idea in our industry, and it's a rising tide lifts all ships. I've been guilty of saying it on stage before, but I want to caution you. There's another half of that saying. A rising tide makes us complacent. Because we're caught in this rising tide that makes us feel like we're all geniuses and our businesses are expanding and rentals are going up. But it may not be because you're as smart as you think you are, that I'm as smart as I think I am. It may be that everything's going up right now. And when that starts to set down and it starts to come back, if we haven't evolved when we had the chance, like the cable companies or like Toys R Us, we're going to be sitting there in the harbor on ground. I don't want that for any of you. I want you guys out at sea. I want you guys evolving. I want you guys taking your business to the next level. You guys are here at this conference. You're going to have lots of chances to study everything that we've just talked about in each of these four areas with different leaders of the industry and your colleagues and your peers. Take the opportunity because we have to evolve if we're going to stay relevant and survive. Thank you.